of God in church. Uh, before we get started on that, of course, you know, I've got to say, go doctor. <laughs> and somewhere, I assume, in Georgia, is Ken crying over the gator school. I hate it for him. You know, with a smaller crowd comes more anticipation of your voice helping me sing these songs. So we're going to all stand and we are going to sing Onward Christian Subjects. Let's pray. 
<clears throat> Father, we do praise you. We love you. We glorify you. You are Almighty God, and there is none. We give thanks this day for your love towards us. You love us with an undying love. You loved us so much that you gave your only Son to come into this world to teach us and to die for us. And we thank you for the gift of salvation. Lord, I thank you for my church family here. You've heard all the requests, all the things that are on our hearts, all the praises from our lips. And we pray, God, that these are pleasing in your sight, and that you'll answer our prayers according to your will, and that you will receive our praise to you, for you are worthy. Bless us this day, O Lord. Speak to our hearts as we open the word in just a little bit, God. Let it touch our very souls and to mold us and to make us into the men and women of God that you want us to be. Help us, O oh God. We fail so often. We're just sinful. So we thank you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Bless us this day. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. They've been listening to me because I always tell them for years it's hard to follow the kids. Well, the kids don't, it's not up here today, so we're going to continue to drive on. Let's continue to praise God through song as we remain seated. We're going to sing all together, Faith of Our Fathers. Church. Many of us will say, well, this is my church. 
Well, in some ways it is our church in that this is what we're part of. This is where we put our membership. This is what we tithe to come in to help keep the church going. It is where we worship. But it really isn't our church. It's God's church. He wanted to plant this church here years and years and years and years and years ago. And it has stood the test of time. And it has had great times and bad times. And uh, all churches go up and down. When I was in uh, seminary, the thought was brought out to us young preachers that were learning that it is always, always hard to keep a good church good all the time. They will always be up and down because people are part of the church. And sometimes we work hard and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we get aggravated and sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's going smooth, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you like a pastor, sometimes you don't like a pastor, sometimes you like the music, sometimes you don't. It's just hard to keep a good church good all the time. My philosophy is this. I'm going to make people mad sometimes uh, while I'm their pastor. But the best thing I can do is try not to get them all mad at the same time. In other words, if I got this little group mad at me now, well, before I get this little group over here mad at me, let me get this group glad of you. And that way I can stay a little bit longer. But you get them all mad at you one time, well, I, you know, I'm from the Baptist background. Uh, you get the Baptist mad at you, you out of here. You get the message, you got to just go talk to the district superintendent, and then I'm out of here. Uh, but uh, church. The Lord said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's an awesome verse. It really is. What I want to be about is trying to figure out how God wants to build His church that is called Emmanuel Methodist Church. What do we need to do? What hurts the church? What's good for the church? Where do we need to be? What do we need to be about? What do we need to be doing? That's a tough job for a pastor. You know, I can't fire you all. I can't. I can't look at Robert down here and say, Robert, I'm tired of you. You're out of here, buddy. Uh, I can't do that. But I work with you. We're partners together to build up his church. So, last Sunday and today, God has put on my heart several things to let you know what kills the church? Not necessarily a manual church, but these are things that will kill a church, and we don't want these things to be a part of our church. Now let me highlight the four things I preached last Sunday, just as a recap. It won't take but a second, but I wrote down those four things, and these are the four things that we looked at last Sunday that kills a church. Number one, unlived truth unlived truth. And I mentioned last week that the scripture says, for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it's a sin. Uh, and I also mentioned the scripture, if you know these things about the word of God, happy are you if you do them. So we need to live out the truth of the word of God. Unlived truth will kill a church. Unholy unions will kill a church. It says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We use that for marriages. We use that for a lot of things. Uh, I think that's good for business. I think it's good for everything. It's not that we don't need to be around unbelievers. We need to go around unbelievers and try to witness to them, re uh, receive them unto our church, unto Christ, and help them to grow. But if they become our best buddies, and we are not making an impact on their life, they are liable to make an impact on our life and take us from being children of God, holy, walking in faith, to no longer doing that. And we all know people that have been in church and come to church and got excited about Jesus and then get pulled away by the world. We've all done that. I've done it in my life at different times. And... Uh, 
So that kills a church. Suppose half of us here today got pulled away from living for the Lord because of unholy unions with the lost world, then this church would continue to go down or would go down. <coughs> Third thing is the unread book. We talked about where it says to study to show thyself approved unto God. Well, the Bible's not always easy to understand. There's a lot of different versions. I have been doing this for 40 some years. I'm used to the King James Version, but I don't always uh, recommend the King James Version. Uh, matter of fact, if you ask me what version you ought to read and study, I would say the New International Version, the NIV. It's a lot easier to understand. It's more in today's English, and it is closer to the Greek in some ways than even the King James Version uh, to try to understand it. Uh, but the unread book, we need to get into it. We need to know what it says. We need to learn to apply it. Uh, and I'll be the first one to tell you, part of it is boring as all get out. You go there in the Old Testament, he begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat this one and so I don't want to know everybody's lineage or uh, their history, family tree. Uh, I will never remember all those names, much less be able to pronounce all those names. And then there's the parts of the Bible that I just cringe at because it is slapping me upside the head because it's telling me how I should live and it's telling me to love everybody, but I don't want to love everybody at times. And uh, forgive people. Lord, do I have to forgive them? Can I just say, God, make them a Philistine and you wipe them out? Uh, sometimes I like to do that. But I'm to love and to forgive. And that challenges me. It may not be a challenge to you, but it's a challenge to me. And then there's some things I really like about the Bible. My sins are forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ. He died for me. I love that. He gave his life for me. Heaven is awaiting the child of God. That's exciting. You know, one day I'm going to have a brand new body that's not going to hurt and ache and get sick and grow old and have wrinkles. I love that. And then he talks about how beautiful heaven's going to be. And our new home up there. A new heaven and an earth. And I love that chapter 21, verse 1, where it says, And I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I like that there won't be nothing to separate us because John was on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote the book of Revelation and he couldn't get back to his family and his friends and his church. And when he got a glimpse of heaven and God told him to write about it, he's looking around and it excited him that he would never be separated from his loved ones again. So when I get to heaven and all my loved ones that's gone on before, we will be together for all eternity. All my friends I've made through the years. I get to see them again. I pastored out in Texas. I was out there for six years. Made lots of good friends. I still hear from quite a, many, quite a few of them. And I've been gone since 86. So, uh, but there's a lot of them that have passed on. And I look forward to seeing them again. People that I no longer get to be around. The grandparents. My grandfather was a Baptist deacon. Yeah, he's one of them. Oh my gosh, I've had my time with deacons. Everybody asked me why I don't have no hair. It's because I go to deacons meetings when I was a Baptist. Nah, nah, that Methodist pastor said it's a good thing I went through a divorce. I'd be a Methodist. Steve Pittman and I were talking today about a little bit about that and what grace I find in the Methodist domination and what love and forgiveness I find here. Just and praise the Lord that we're all one in the family of God. Amen, but not everybody acts like this one. And some of them black sheep, they think I'm a black sheep, so that's the way it goes. But I love the church, and sometimes the unread book, we don't know the scriptures, don't apply the scriptures, so we don't get to grow. And then last week, the unconcerned members. 
those who are only concerned about money, those who are concerned about themselves and what they can get out of it and stuff like that, kill a church. But quickly, I got four more to share with you today. Number five out of that series of eight, eight thoughts is the uncommitted majority. I've heard it all my life. Billy Graham drove it home in my life that out of any church, 20% do the work and 80% do nothing. I cannot, uh, for most churches I, that I've pastored, I'd say that's a true statement. I have come to find here the manual, that's not a true statement. You're a working bunch of people. And I don't know if that's your nature, or I'm just pushing, or whatever, or God's just come upon y'all. But uh, we have a working group of people here trying to do stuff and make our church a better church and to build up the kingdom of God. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 4, it says about the church at Sardis, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The uncommitted majority, but the Lord says there's only a few names there in that church in Sardis out of uh, the third chapter of Revelation, and they've not defiled their garments, and not defiled themselves, and they walk with the Lord, and he says they are worthy. May we be like those few at Sardis that we are worthy to walk with the Lord because we are committed to Him. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37, Then said He unto His disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He looked at His disciples one day and said, Fellas, Look around you. A lot of lost people out there. The harvest is huge. It's plenteous. But the laborers that go out into the harvest to work are but a few. And as we look around, houses after houses all around our church and growing more. And from what I understand, his Brunswick's going to explode over the next five years with even more. The harvest is plenteous. Are we going to be a few laborers or are we going to be a bunch of laborers out of our church to make this church grow? The more I pray about it, the more I think about it, the more I seek the face of God. If you, probably, if you all still want to keep me around, you know every January the pastor has to sign a paper. Does he want to go? Does he want to stay or doesn't know? The SPR, Staff Parish Committee, has to sign a paper to turn into the district also. Do we want our pastor to stay? Do we want our pastor to go? Or we don't know. Come June, I'll be here two years. I've got to make a decision in January. Do I want to stay or go? Or I don't know. For a while now, I have not known. But here lately, God has been impressed upon my heart to make this a long-term pastor. If come January, you want to keep me. Amen. It's all in God's hands. I am committed to see this church go from our normal 50 to 60 people to 100 and on up to 200. We are going to be making some changes the first of the year in the way we worship. I already talked to Chris about it, Paul about it, some others about it. We're going to be making some changes to see what it will take for us to truly worship, truly draw closer to the Lord, and to be the church that God wants us to be. You don't need the church I want you to be. Because I make mistakes. But I want to seek the face of God and make sure we're being the church that God wants us to be. Now, we're not going to do anything really, really drastic, but there will be some changes in the way we worship, the way we do songs, do some things back to back to back on songs, and just get into a series of praise. 
Because I'll tell you up front, it bothers me. We have some great music here. And I enjoy it. But we stand up and we sing, and then we sit down and we do welcome announcements, and we stand up and we sing, and then we quit that, and then we do children's sermons, or we do uh, prayer requests, and then we sing, and then we take up an offering, and then we sing, and then the preacher preaches. And I want you to know my heart. I want us to get to a point where we can do some of this stuff up at the front part of our service. And then before the message that God has for us, get into a habit of maybe singing two or three songs back to back. And once we stand to praise God, and singing is one of the greatest ways of praising God. We don't just stop and then do announcements. We don't stop and take up an offering. We get that stuff out of the way up front and get to a place where we really want to praise God. And then, have God speak to us through His Word. So, to me, it's not drastic. If you've never done anything like that, it may be a bigger change. But all I'm asking you is just to pray about it, to go with it, and let's get to a point where we're really doing church like God wants us to. Where we're really pouring out our hearts in singing and praise to Him and lifting Him up. You know, if we get to that point, the Scripture tells us, it teaches us that if we lift Jesus up, He will draw unworthy people unto Himself. We just got to get to where we're really lifting up Jesus Amen. and worshiping. Now, I'm not going to be running up and down the aisles. I don't run nowhere anymore. I saw Finn... Uh, as we come, come up and we, they lit the candles and everything, I thought, well, Finn ran back down the aisle, but why didn't Brenda run with you? <laughs> and I thought, I wouldn't be able to run. I'd trip, fall, and I might not, Lord might not catch me. He might say, you need to fall flat on your face, kid. <laughs> but um, you're not going to do anything that's, everything's going to be done decent and in order, and that will honor our Lord. Yeah. And that's what's on my heart. And God may change it, but that's what He's put on my heart. And you pray for your pastor. You pray for me as I try to lead us into what's going to make our church a growing church. We have the love here. No doubt about it. There's love in this church. But we have a giving church. Look at all we've done. And we have a working church. From going out in the community and doing things and projects to help people, to doing things here at our church. I just want to up our worship to the next level. Amen. That's what's on my heart. Amen. So, I don't like getting through with this today, but the uncommitted majority, I'm asking you to be committed to your church. There will be times that you won't feel like getting up on Sunday morning and coming. There will be times you won't feel like teaching or working or going. I understand that. There will be times you may not be totally in agreement, but I'm asking you to work together, work with me. Give your all. If your all is all you can do is because of health or whatever is to pray, pray. If you're always making a phone call to somebody and say, I miss you at church, make a phone call. If you're always sending out a card, send out a card. If you're physically able to go out and have Randy on hands-on ministry and do stuff out in our community, use that strength and use your abilities to do that. If you're able to teach, teach. If you're able to sing in the choir, sing in the choir. Whatever God has given you the abilities, the talents to do, use it for His glory. Amen. Number six, unpaid tithes. Well, I believe we're a given church, and we wouldn't have had the funds to do all we've done. So I don't know if this is for you or not. I throw it out there. And it's up to God to take it home if this needs to hit you between the eyes. If this is not for you, 
throw it over your shoulder to the person behind you. Unpaid tithes. I believe in tithe. I believe a tithe is 10%. I'm a radical about it. I believe if you plant a garden, you ought to give a tenth of it away. This is not just on your money. I believe you ought to give you money too. I'm a firm believer that if you tithe, you will be blessed. I'm a firm believer that you will not be blessed if you do not tithe. I believe in tithing on what you make. You make $10 an hour, work 40 hours a week, you make $400, you make $400, you tithe off of that. You say, well, the government got about 50 of that dollars, and the insurance got another 50, I only got 300. You tithe off what you make. That's how I believe. You don't have to agree with me. Just pray about it. But I believe whatever you make, you tithe off of it. Can't help it what the government does. Can't help it the insurance costs us, costs us an arm and a leg. But I believe that we ought to honor the Lord. Now, I tell you all of this, I can back it up with Scripture. So listen to what it says out of Malachi. <clears throat> and listen really close because I want you to be blessed. Malachi chapter 3, it says in verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. That's what God was saying. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? They were saying, how have we robbed you, God? And God says, in tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Amen. That's the word of God. We think of cursing as somebody saying a bad word towards us. But here in Malachi, the idea of a curse is bringing bad things upon us. Now, I'm not worried about somebody that practices voodoo wanting to put a curse on me. I'm not worried about any of you that wants to put a curse on me because you don't like me. But I'm scared to death that God might want to put a curse on me simply because I won't give my money to Him. And it's His anyhow. And everything I've got, He's blessed me with. Now, that's the downside. And if you're not tithing, you may not be cursed today and you may not be cursed tomorrow. But God said it's coming. Now how does it come? I don't have a clue. It may come with bad health and you're going to lose all your money because you're going to pay it to the doctors. I don't know. You may have an automobile that would last you another 10 or 20 years but because you won't tithe he's going to let it be broke down every other month. God has his ways of doing things. And I like the positive side of it. If we will tithe, he says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing on you, you're not going to be able to stand it. You ever had something so good and so much you can't stand it? That's kind of like somebody bringing me that divinity candy in a big bowl. And there's so much there that I know if I eat it, I will pass out because I'm going to have a sugar high. And that's too much for me to stand. Have you ever had a baby or a grandchild to hug and kiss on you so much you didn't think you could hardly stand it and you ate it up and you loved it? Well, God says, I'm going to pour out a blessing in your life so great you can't stand it. If you're tired. Up to you folks. I'm going to give you the word of God. It's up to you how you want to look at it. I used to tell people, God really convicted me. He whooped me good on that. People come to me and say, Pastor, I can't tie. I got myself in such a bad way. I can't tie. But I give 2 or 3% instead of 10%. 
And you know, I'm thinking worldly. I'm thinking, trying to be smart. Well, if you can only give 3%, maybe this coming year give 3% more. That will be 6 and The next year, give 4%, you'll be up to 10%. Sounds like good wisdom, doesn't it? Sounds like good advice. It just ain't got to be advice. I have no right to tell you if you get 3%, go ahead and give 3 more percent on top of that next year, give 6%. God says, give a tithe of 10%. Who am I to go against God? So God revealed that to me that I was wrong. So I'm going to tell you, tithe if you want to, there's the blessings. Don't tithe, there's the curse. It's not one of these, well, if I don't, don't tithe, nothing's going to happen. I wouldn't chance that, folks. Not according to the scripture. And it's not that I'm up here after your money, but if you'll bring it in, we'll make sure we use it for God's glory. That's the one thing for sure. But a lot of times churches die out because of unpaid tithe. People don't want to give. Setting on thousands. I'm a dollar error. Some of you may be hundred errors. It's thousand errors. It's million errors. I don't know what you got. I'm not impressed by your money. I don't need to know your money. Did you know Methodist pastors have the right and have the ability to go and look at what everybody gives? I know a lot of pastors that do that. Now the Baptists, they don't, they don't put up with that. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be influenced by what you give or don't give. So I don't know what you give and don't give. And I am not going to go look. Even though I could as a Methodist pastor. I don't agree with that. What you give is between you and God. We document it if you want it to be documented. Used to be for tax purposes. I don't know if that many people would use it for taxes the way things are changed around nowadays. But uh, it's between you and God. And I pray that you'll be blessed because you're obedient to God. Number seven, unbent knees. Unbent needs. Churches are dying because of unbent needs, which means a lack of prayer. The only way the church can stand in this world is by being on its knees before God. I don't have the strength. I don't have the power. I don't have the education. I don't have the brilliance to stand before this world and change this whole world. God does. By being on my knees, I ask God, make these things happen if it's part of your will. God heal people. God forgive people. God bring people into the kingdom. God build the real church. I pray over it all. I believe in prayer. I believe in talking to God. We do so little of it. I can only imagine, I'm going to pick a little bit, I can only imagine Susan's gotten sick and we've been praying for him. And Eric works, if you don't know this, normally Monday through Friday in Albany, Georgia. That's why they can have a good marriage. He's gone most of the time. <laughs> but now that Susan's gone through all these tests and everything, Eric's been able to work from home. I can imagine all the talking whole lot more than they're used to. Susan's agreeing. Yeah. Did you know this? Men only use a certain number of words. And they don't talk a lot. Women use a bigger number of words. And they know how to use them. And they know how to use them over and over and over. <laughs> now I agree with I agree with Brenda today. I'm 
Brenda's back here working with the children, so I'm, she's not here to experience all of this. I know some of you go go tell her. I've been picking on her. But she said, do you know, the women of this church run this church. And I said, I agree with you. I'm not dumb. I'm not going to argue with her over that. By no means. The men are the head. The women are the neck. Whichever way the neck turns is the way the head's going to point. But, uh, We talk to each other a lot. We carry on. We laugh. We communicate. Only to God if we communicate that much with our Heavenly Father. We don't have to pray King James prayers. We don't have to pray uh, output prayers. We just need to talk to God. And talk to Him often. And if we hurt, God will hurt. We don't like something? God, I don't like it. Maybe you will. I don't like it. Don't change my heart to like it. We talk to God. What kills the church is unbent knees where we don't pray over stuff. Last of all, we get out of here because I know the women are going to meet and uh, the men are probably going to have to go out and forge for themselves. Find them somewhere to find some grub. The uncommitted majority, the unpaid tithes, the unbent knees, and last of all, the unconfessed sin. How many times do we sin and we don't confess it? We make excuses. Well, they did that to me first. Or I was up against this. Or I don't feel like confessing. Illustrate. King David, looking over his castle wall one day, he saw Bathsheba down there bathing. She was naked. He looked down and saw from his castle wall, he lusted. Now, I ain't blaming David on that. I understand that. I probably would have too. And if you were honest, you might have too. Uh, I hope I'm not around these holy of holies that don't never see them. I hope I'm among the majority of us that we realize we are sinners. <coughs> David lusted. If he had confessed it, given it over to God, and dealt with it, he probably wouldn't have gone to the next step, which was adultery. Had Bathsheba brought into him, and he committed adultery with her. If he had stopped then and, and confessed it and been forgiven and Got it under the blood of Jesus, so to say, because Jesus had died at that time, but giving it over to God. Maybe, just maybe, life wouldn't have been so tough on him. But he went to the next step. He tried to cover up his sin, and so Bathsheba's husband was a warrior. He was a soldier. And he had him brought in from the battle. They were in war. And he had him brought in thinking that he would be with his wife and that the baby that was going to be born would be her husband. But her husband came home and he would not go in to know his wife because it's not right for all my fellow soldiers out there giving their life on the battlefield and me, me here in the arms of my wife. And so he did not go in. And David began to panic instead of pray. What am I going to do? He's going to realize, her husband's going to realize she's been with another man. And it'll eventually come out. What am I going to do? David got his pen out, wrote a letter, sealed it with the king's seal, gave it to her husband. He delivered it back to his commanding officer, Commanding officer saw the letter, opened it up, saw it was a seal from the king, looked at it, read it to himself, and here's what he said. Put him at the first forefront of the battle, and then withdraw from it, knowing that he would be killed. David, in essence, committed murder. He went from lust to adultery <coughs> to murder. And God brought judgment upon him. But in the end, listen at the words of David. 
In Psalm 32, 5, it says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest me the iniquity of my sin. David got back right with God. God eventually said, this is a man after my own heart. We can be men and women after God's heart and be sinners. It's just whether we're going to confess that sin and draw closer to God. If I carry sin with me, the Bible teaches God will not hear my prayers. And if I confess my sin, 1 John 1, 9 tells us that He is faithful to forgive me of all my sins and my righteousness and he will restore me back into his fellowship. I've used this illustration before. If Randy and I have a fallen out and we don't make it right, there will be a wall between me and Randy. But if Randy and I have a fallen out, whether it's his fault, my fault, doesn't matter, both of our faults, but we go to each other and we say, I forgive you, will you forgive me, or will you forgive me? Uh, whatever we need to say to work it out, we tear down that wall and we become close again. That wall separates us where we're not close. We're still brothers in Christ. We can still be in the same church. But if that wall is there, there's not that sweet fellowship. <coughs> but if we tear that wall down, there's a sweet fellowship. You as a child of God, when you sit in if you tear down that wall by confessing that sin, you fellowship with God even closer. But if you ignore the sin, you don't confess it, you say, well, I was done wrong. Whatever excuse you want to give, if that sin remains, God will still love you. But there will be a wall there. And there will be a time when you would wish God would bless you, but you built that wall up there to not receive his blessings. So those are some thoughts about what kills the church. May these not be part of your life. May these not be part of Emmanuel's life. But these are out there. And so may we not be the uncommitted majority. May we not be those that have unpaid tithes. May we be, not be one of those that has unbent knees. And may we definitely not be one of those that has unconfessed sin. As Peter wrote, it's time for judgment to begin in the house of God. It's time for your pastor to always look at his life. It's time for you to look at your life. It's time for us to look at our lives. To not hurt the church, but to build it up. That's what we're to be about. I do, as Chris comes, as Paula comes to lead us in our invitation song and then go into communion. I do love you. I hope you know that. I do bring this message as a message of love. Because I want God's richest of blessings upon you individually and upon us as a church. There's things that I have mentioned today that you need to come and pray about. You come. We're quickly going to have this invitation time. Then go back to our seats and we will serve communion. Would you stand and would you come and God put it on your heart? All the same.